In 2013, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and IGRO, SDSU Extension, for delivering the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. A series of four local events were held in South Dakota in Sioux Falls, Watertown, Belfouche, and Mitchell. No-Till, the prime spur. Uh, where did that come from? It's not no secret code uh, or anything like that. And as I talk today, uh, maybe you will come up with, uh, with what I'm trying to say. And uh, I'll, if not, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you at the end. It's no big secret or anything. But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm not going to talk about uh, putting spurs <laughs> on your tennis shoes or anything like that. And uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, seeing the foot doctor because you got some type of problem that way. But uh, anyway, um, uh, Dr. Ward kind of hinted at it uh, a little bit in, in one of his slides there. And so we'll get on with this and, and uh, go forward. But why do we do tillage? Um, do, we, do we think about that at all? What's the reason? And uh, is it uh, serve a purpose? You know, just make us feel better? You know, I'm, I was raised on a farm in eastern uh, Minnehaha County. Um, <coughs> family's been there over 100 years, and much like uh, most of you in the room. And uh, I've sat in that tractor seat and dropped that chisel plow on the ground and felt, felt the power of the tractor. And, and uh, it, it, you know, it, there's, a, there's a allure to it, isn't there? But uh, I think we really have to question this and why we're doing this. Is, is it really to prepare the seed bed? You know, is that why we're doing it? And, and so I'm going to talk about that. And, and maybe it's to make us feel better as I just talked. And, 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 but really, um, why do we loosen the soil up just to, just to pack it back down? To make a firm place to place our seed. Does that make sense? I, you know, in my mind, it really doesn't. And uh, so I, I'm just going to present some of these things to provoke, provoke some thinking and some thoughts and, and why we do things. Um, so I really think it's because Dr. Ward said it himself. I think what we're using is we're reacting to that. And, and I got just two examples here. I tried to be, not be colorblind. I got a green and a red up there. And, and uh, it, it just really has a lot to do with the type of equipment we've been, we have available to us, really, isn't it? We loosen it up so these two things right here can pack it back down. Isn't that right? And so, you know, the system we have is powerful. Our ag machine we have in, in the United States is, is paramount. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's a powerful thing. And, uh, you know, we're not criticizing it in any way, but we, we have to think about the system and, and why we do these things. So, uh, next slide, you know, do, do we really need all this stuff? And um, it just seems in my history of being you know, on the farm in, in, in the late 70s and early 80s and, and uh, the size of equipment, of course farms are getting bigger, I realize that too, but it seems to me that the bigger our combines and our grain carts, the bigger we've had to make this stuff, okay? And these things here. And, and you know, is it really necessary? And I think, uh, I think uh, the, the presenters today are, 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 are going in a way or are leading us to topics and things to think about that, that uh, are, are leading us to think away from these things. And um, so, and, and then I put this up here. Uh, uh, it, it's kind of a controversial issue now. And I, I remember the days where we talked about zone tillage, you know, a, top, a very popular topic for many meetings. And, did some research on it, and you know it was tilling deeper, you know, in the soil to try to to try to do something. Um, and now we have the exact opposite, don't we? A, a lot less. And really, isn't it pointing to what we're really all talking about today? Reducing reducing tillage and going to no till. Uh, to switch gears just a little bit, uh, something that I've noticed uh, in the last three or four years. Uh, um, all the bailing that's going on. Um, and you really wonder, is it all necessary? Um, I, I can't fault the livestock producer that has to provide for, for animals. Um, that's totally understandable, and I, I, I get that. 
But I do see a lot of semi trucks going down the interstate at 75 miles an hour loaded full of bales. And then they're going somewhere. And, and so what are we doing when we're doing this? And i uh, got some statistics here. Dr. Jansen at SDSU uh, reported that residue bailing has increased uh, um, from about 16% in 2007 to around 50% in 2010. Now, do we have any more cows or livestock <laughs> to, today than we did back then? And so, you know, we get calls, you know, what's the value of our crop residue? And, and you know, we can measure the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the sulfur, and all the other nutrients in it. We can kind of come up with a number and give you a value. We want to put a dollar value on it. But it, it's really worth more than that. And I think you're, you're hearing that today. Just to show you, uh, the value of organic matter in the soil uh, was part of a study um, back in the late 90s. And um, it, it, it was a study not to research this, but, but, but sometimes we can glean from, from studies other things. And, and so what I did here is I plotted the, uh, the, uh, the check plots where we didn't have any treatments. It had full nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium applied. So it was, it was like the other plots in the study. But, but what I did is we did measure organic matter in these plots, and it varied across the study. Um, and so, you know, we can just see clearly uh, the influence of soil organic matter here on the x-axis of this graph, its effect on corn yield. And, uh, and we, we did it in another site, too, up uh, by uh, uh, Aberdeen or Chelsea, South Dakota, and uh, we could do the same thing. And it's, it's quite striking, and, and really when you look at the graph, you know, it's going the same way, and even about the same yield levels. I'm not implying that, that, uh, that you're, you're gonna see these results if, if, you, if you improve your soil organic matter like this, but it, it demonstrates and shows the direct effect of the importance, importance of organic matter in the soil. So, uh, I sat back there this morning and added a, uh, a, a slide to my presentation, and uh, I, Jason Miller, I'm gonna say he requested it, and he was so happy that, that I had done this. And it's a very simplistic approach, and uh, other soil scientists could, could beat me up all day about this. There's assumptions here, but at some point you have to, you have to choose a number and go with it. And so, uh, what does it take to increase your soil organic matter by 1%? Well, we know that the uh, uh, acre fertile slice of soil is about 2 million pounds, right there. And we take that 1%, uh, that's about 20,000 pounds of what, what we call stable organic matter. That's not raw plant residue. That's, that's stable organic matter that's gonna, gonna benefit uh, soil aggregation and other soil properties. So how do we determine how, uh, what it takes to get that? Um, some say the conversion of raw plant residue material to stable organic matter is anywhere between 10 to 20 percent. Um, there's a place that uh, you could probably find some literature that would, would uh, deviate from that. But, uh, so in this, in this example, I used uh, 10 percent. So just a simple ratio here, we need about 200,000 pounds of raw crop residue per acre to, uh, to increase about 1% uh, soil organic matter. That, that's a lot. So all those bales you see going down the interstate uh, are taking away from, from that, aren't they? Um, so I got a simple rotation here. Um, uh, very optimistic yields, I think. Uh, 200 bushel corn, uh, 75 bushel soybeans. Wouldn't you like to have that every year? Uh, 80 bushel wheat. Okay, so very, very optimistic, of course. Uh, but then again, I chose the 10% the uh, conversion. So, so uh, there's a little trade off there. But over a three year period, those yields would produce about 20,000 pounds of, of raw. Um, crop residues. So simple math, that 200,000 pounds that it takes, divided by the 20, we get 10 years. But it's a three year rotation, so about 30 years to get 1% increase. And I, I, I've heard the, the talk and, and, 
and those that claim I, you know, gee, I went to no-till and my organic matter went up one, one and a half percent in, you know, four or five years. So how can that be? Or how can this be? And what will you attribute that to, to is the change in, in the system and um, sampling depth and sampling variability is huge when it comes to measuring um, organic matter and uh, the test itself. But, but the math shows, and we know, uh, that it takes a long time to build organic matter in the soil and to build soil, period. So it's an important issue. So what does uh, no-till really do to the soil? Here I have uh, a couple pictures of the soil surface. Uh, the one on the left here is long-term no-till um, in excess of 20 years. Uh, after soybeans, so not a lot of cover on the soil, and I kind of, kind of fell into this uh, by accident, <laughs> because uh, here in, in, and I apologize, it's not very easy to see, but there are earthworm casts all over this this picture. Okay, um, it, it's alive, and uh, it, it, in some one time uh, I was out in that field after a rain, and, and uh, it was twilight or the sun was just setting. And uh, the ground was moving, literally. It caught my attention. And there were so many night crawlers out there, you could, you could hardly believe it. I couldn't believe it. I just, you know, this, this, is really, this is really impressive. And then over here, I have a picture of a soil surface, soybeans also, where they uh, have been doing a lot of intensive tillage, and they bailed it. And so we can just see the difference in the the general appearance of the soil surface. And so, which one is going to exchange air and water and other gases better? It's easy to tell, isn't it? This one on the left. Uh, there's hardly any soil structure left in the one on the right. <coughs> so these improved soil properties that, that no-till uh, can, can uh, lead to our soil aggregation, where we have uh, the soil particles clumping together by uh, the effect of, uh, um, you know, the, the craters in the biota in the soil, as Dr. Lehman talked, uh, they're holding and helping to clump those together. That is, leads to better water and air movement in the soil. Soil structure is leading, this is all leading to soil structure where we have uh, these aggregates forming together and to, uh, to uh, beneficial soil structure. And what does that do? It, it, it improves the strength of the soil. It, uh, it, it makes the soil so that it can, uh, helps the soil so it can bear more load. Uh, its load capacity is, is higher. Some say, well, it's so hard. Well, that, that's what you're experiencing, is you're experiencing uh, the soil's ability to, to, bear, to bear more loads. And I'm not advocating getting the uh, 1,200 bushel grain card out there, but um, it, it, it's just a, a better thing. Carbon and nutrient storage. Um, Dr. Ward talked about the Haney test, of course. Um, you know, uh, improved uh, organic matter. Uh, we're improving our phosphorus exchange. Um, we've been talking about that a little bit. The microbial diversity we've been talking about, the activity, the mycorrhizal fungi, of course, uh, acting as those root extensions. Just the residue cover itself, the armor or the protection over the soil, you know, the reduced water loss and erosion, and, and uh, we're, we're just protecting it. Um, and, and another topic you wouldn't even think about, and, and being in the soil testing business a little bit and, and uh, taking uh, thousands of samples, um, I know I'd much rather sample a no-till field than a till field any day. Uh, and so it leads to better consistency in your results. Um, a no-till soil sample is so much better that you get an accurate six-inch sample. And uh, it, I think that will lead to better, better management um, in the soil testing. Temperature moderation, we're not going from these extremes. Um, and so that aids in, in the microbial activity and nutrient conversion in the soil. You know, I think in the drought year, um, some of those soil temperatures got really high in the surface. And we probably killed some beneficial microorganisms in the soil. And so uh, temperature moderation is important. And again, earthworm diversity and activity, moving the soil around and, and 
digesting whatever they digest in their system, and uh, that's beneficial. So what does uh, long-term no-till look like? This, this sample here, or this uh, picture is taken from uh, Al Miran's farm in Crook, South Dakota. He's been no-tilling about 25 years. And uh, we, this is in the drought year, so it was really hard and dried out, of course. But we see the aggregation here and the roots that are growing in between those aggregates. We see the holes, the old root channels or earthworm channels. And so we just see the, uh, the benefits right there versus uh, if we would have tilled that soil and, and took all that structure out. Um, I, I have a, uh, a friend, I guess you'd call him, uh, kind of a relative in a way, he's related to the Bly family, uh, down the tree quite a ways, but uh, um, he was an inspiration for, for my dad and I in our farm. We started no tilling as well as, as going back. I think we could both say that, that uh, we were listening to Dwayne quite intensely many, many years ago. But I asked uh, Stan why we no till. And uh, he says, I'll tell you why we no till. He says, you remember uh, the spring of uh, 2012? I said, sure do. He said it, it uh, poured like crazy, didn't it? Now that was the drought year. But in April, we had some really intense storms come through. And he says, you remember all those gullies and all those neighbor's fields? I said, I sure do. And uh, he says, that's why I don't tell. And uh, of course, there's many other reasons, of course. But, but basically, um, he said he had a neighbor come by. And he said, Stan, just check in your fields to see if they wash like ours. And they didn't. And uh, he says, see, that's, that's why I don't tell. In fact, Stan told me last week that uh, he's told people that he, if he has to give up no tell, he's, he's done farming. He's just done. So that's how important is it to him. But what I have here is an aerial photograph of uh, some land. And uh, um, there's a quarter section here that's no tilled. And uh, hopefully it's, it's, it may be sticking out to you there. But there's some things about this no-till quarter that are different from the surrounding, surrounding farmland. This very hilly farmland uh, can have up to a 12% slope in some places. There's some terraces on this picture. And um, there's some very obvious features. This field here, you can see the, the terraces in it. Okay? They're old terraces. The, the, the producer now farms straight over them. Uh, they are probably 40, 50 years old, made for a four-row planter and out the big equipment. You know, it, it's no problem. But what you also see in this field are these, these rills coming down, down the drainage ways. And when we got that intense rain, it, it just couldn't hold it. It just went, okay? Those rills are, well, they're showing up on this, this photograph. Um, they're six, eight inches deep. Eight, six, eight foot across some places, okay? And, and so that, that soil let go. And, um, but the no-till quarter is the one right next to it. And uh, these are grass waterways here, okay? Right here. There are two terraces there that you can see. Um, this field here uh, is full of them too. And uh, you can't see them. This was taken in August of 2012, right in the middle of the drought. And uh, you should be able to see them, like you do over here, OK? But you can't. Um, this is corn. This is corn. Soybeans. This is soybeans and soybeans. Um, it, uh, this is over 20 years of no-till on that quarter. Um, you can see some differences in shading there, which, which you should be able to. It's very sloped and everything. But all in all, it's a lot more even looking, isn't it? And this is the middle of August. It's just, just making it through. Um, there's extra water there. And, uh, and, and the management is totally different. Conversing to this field here, um, that's also corn. You can see it, it giving up. The corn is just done on some of those side hills. Um, this field over here especially too. It's just done. I realize it could be different hybrids. Uh, I realize it could be different climbing days. All in all, it was pretty much done the, you know, on the same time. 
but just some visual evidence of what's going on. Another thing that we don't think about a lot is uh, something that's been called tillage erosion. And uh, Dr. Schumacher, um, Dr. Lobb in Canada, um, Dr. Lindstrom, ARS, I, others, many others. And it's, it's, it's not a new thing. Um, in Europe, they discovered this a uh, long time ago. And it's nothing more than moving the soil down the hill with tillage. And that's erosion. And uh, when we think about precision farming and all that we can do, farm by the square foot, this is a big deal. It's, it's not so much you know, encroaching on your neighbor or on, on, on water quality or, or anything like that. We're just moving soil off this knoll, down the hill, down here. It's within your own field. But you're decreasing productivity in one place, and you probably or maybe are decreasing it there too. If you think about, you know, water and water management and so forth. And so, it, it, you know, you, you till down the hill, the soil goes with you a certain distance. And if you turn right around and tilt the exact track up the hill, it doesn't come up the hill as far, the soil. And I think when you think about that, it really makes sense, doesn't it? And so, it, it's a real thing. And so, um, my buddy Joe and I, standing right there, once in a while we would have time uh, uh, from our work to go goof around a little bit. And uh, this is one of those days where we uh, found a field on our farm. Um, and uh, this is not a very big hill, but it's, it's there. And we have grass here that's probably not been farmed. Uh, we really don't have any records of it being farmed. Actually, the original homestead was just right over here on this hill. And uh, it was just, there's some huge trees here. But in the corner, um, it, it was used as a pasture. And, and, and we really don't know if it was ever farmed. We don't think it ever was. But the field, um, 80 to 100 years of, of tillage there, uh, 20 years of no-till. But what we did is we set up three sites. You see the flags here that I have circled. And uh, at each one of those sites, we took some cores. And, and, and bear with me, this is no budget research. <laughs> so we, we uh, <laughs> you know, we're just, we're just having fun because Joe and I like soil and, and uh, we like things like this. But what we did is we took cores at each one of those flags. And these are small cores. I realize they're hard to see, but in the middle there, there is a soil core, and you kind of see the difference in color as you go down, especially with this. And so at the top, the middle, and the bottom of the hill, we took a sample in the grass and one in the tilled. And I drew a line here, or an arrow, where you can see the dark soil colors. So in the grass, you can see it goes down to about here. That's quite a ways compared to just, just right across the fence in the tilled where it was tilled for a long time. In the middle part of the slope, um, the grass is a little bit less. The depth of the dark soil colors is a little bit less. Not much, but a little bit. <coughs> and on the tilled soil, you can see here in the middle part of the slope that the dark soil colors are go down to about here. But then right in about here, there's light soil colors again. Light soil on top of dark soil. And so what's happening is the darker soil from the top or the shoulder landscape position is overtopping the better soil on the middle landscape position. And I'm not advocating um, tile drainage, but I was in Wisconsin on a farmer's field day there about cover crops. And the father and son are, are advocate no-tillers right now. Um, and uh, they have a tile drainage business. But they, they admitted um, that the reason they went no-till is when they started installing drain tile, they noticed all the light colored soil on top of the dark colored soil. And it convinced them just then and there that something had to be done. And that's what's happening here. And so you go down to the bottom of the hill, we've got obviously dark, dark soil all the way down. But up but over here in the tilled side, again, it's, there's a lighter soil material over the darker soil material. And so you think about those implications about what we're doing, um, uh, that tillage is, is really going against us, isn't it? And I realize this is a hill, 
If you have flat fields, it isn't an issue for you. But there's other issues there, wind erosion and such. So um, how does no-till yield compare? Um, I always like to go to literature and, and, and what others have done. And so this is just a literature, simple literature review across all these locations. Iowa, South Dakota, Minnesota, Indiana, Tony Vine here, some data from Indiana, Ontario, Illinois, wherever I could find it. And I just plotted the no-till yield versus the conventional till and there's strip till in here also. And you don't see much deviation between those at all, do you? And I got the average over here. You know, no-till's a little slightly less because of probably a couple locations where there was a, maybe a little bit of a problem. But you don't see them jumping out at all. So, you know, the reasons for tillage just aren't there. How about in South Dakota? Um, a lot of the research that I was involved with, with uh, Dr. Gelderman and Jim Goering and Howard Woodard had a tillage component in them. And so I took that tillage component out and plotted the yields of corn and beans uh, comparatively here and, and still the same thing. Not huge differences at all. So you, you, if you're wondering, well, then why don't we no-till? You know, why haven't I tried it? I tried it and got out. I was thinking about other problems with it. And one of those might be fertilizer replacement. I don't know. Um, could be, so I tried to pick out some things. And a uh, study at the uh, Southeast Research Farm and, and in Brookings, uh, both locations, long, longer, um, not exceedingly long no-till, um, a 10-year cycle there of no-till, but uh, uh, just a comparison of placement of phosphorus. Okay, C fan versus broadcast. Um, you can see here essentially no difference between those two. Um, this is an average over soil test, of course. Um, a nice response here, though, to phosphorus. And so uh, that broadcast um, performing just as well. And it could be the, uh, the, the, mic the fungi in the soil. Is that, is that what's helping here? I don't know. We didn't measure that. Other locations that we've had phosphorus placement in, uh, in no-till. Uh, Brookings County on soybeans, uh, band versus broadcast. Nice response to phosphorus rate. Uh, broadcast maybe slightly less than the band, uh, but all in all, pretty comparable. Um, with uh, spring wheat, no-till spring wheat here in Brookings County, um, similar results. So there's a little uh, data from, from fertilizer placement. But uh, I was at a, uh, a soil fertility conference uh, a year or so ago, and uh, um, Dr. Uh, Fernandez in the University of Illinois, now with the University of Minnesota though, um, did a, a soil sampling study. And he compared no-till broadcast to strip-till broadcast and strip-till deep end, five and six inch depth. And he wanted to measure the effect on, on soil testing and where, where those, where P and K was at. And I can't show you all the data because there's too much of it, but the summary showed that deep banding the fertilizer reduced the surface to subsurface PCAS P and K stratification ratio, therefore increasing the soil test in the subsurface with the fertilizer application. So by and large, what he's saying is the crop was still taking the nutrients out of the soil surface. Even though in the, in the strip till where they were putting it deeper, you know, you would think the plant roots would go for that. The majority of the phosphorus and potassium was taken out of the surface of the soil, the top two to, two to three inches. So on our farm, um, this is the planter that I set up back in 1991. Um, I remember the evening I sat in the living room with my dad and my uncle telling them about what I just heard about, no-till, and uh, what it would do. Uh, being a young graduate student then and, and uh, so forth, they, they thought I was just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this young kid didn't know what he was talking about. Really. And I remember my uncle saying, <laughs> well, you're going to have to plow it sometime, aren't you? And uh, I said, no, I, I don't think so. 
And so this is the plan we set up, and uh, basically uh, fertilizer issues here. We, we put nitrogen sulfur in our saddle tanks, and we had an opener here that we placed it five inches from the row. Uh, on the planter, we had our, our PK and zinc. Uh, full rate, 30% uh, was put on the seed. I split it, and I put 70% in that, or uh, are on with that, uh, that coulter that put the nitrogen and the sulfur on. Because at that time, you know, we didn't have uh, the, the data that we had about broadcast <coughs> phosphorus or no-till. And uh, so we just thought, we gotta get it off the ground. And I, I was dead set to make, make this no-till work with my dad and my uncle. And so that's the plan we had. And, and since then, uh, these have come off. And all we do is we put a little starter on with the seed and we're in a broadcast program. And uh, uh, it's working. Um, I, I believe the improved soil properties with no-till and the biota in the soil are getting those nutrients to the crop. Um, along with the data that I've showed you uh, on placement, it's important, um, I think. Uh, there is some data to show that if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're needing some phosphorus, uh, your soil tests are lower, certainly the banded applications are better. But if you're, you're managing your phosphorus toil, soil test levels at the adequate levels, then the maintenance of that is probably you know, okay to put that out as a broadcast application. So other tips for no-till <coughs> success, I believe it starts right here. I drive around the country, uh, I can relate to Dr. Ward, you know, just driving around looking and, and uh, I see this all the time and I, I kind of cringe. And I realize why it's happening. These big combines, these big heads, you just can't throw it out there. But really when you think about it, we need to have this look like this, don't we? Yep. So we can do a better job of planting into that. And uh, the soil temperatures are, are the same and everything is just, just more even. And, and you can have better results if you do handle your, your residue in the fall much better. Our biggest challenge on our farm was the sidewall compaction. And, and this, we have silt loam soils, and silt loam soils, you wet them up, and you dry them out, and they're brick, okay? Um, Dr. Nathan Mueller, our new agronomist at SDSU, is from Northeast Nebraska, silt loam soils just like I got, says the same thing. Never did so much rotary hoeing when he was a kid. I mean, I, I rotary hoed all the time. Those surface crusts were, were just monsters. And so when we went to no-till, this, this really resulted in really the biggest challenge. And one year, we just couldn't get rid of that, uh, that sidewall on the uh, seed fur opener there. I, I, did, I couldn't get rid of it. <laughs> I had tools there on my planter that I thought were the best, and, and uh, this is just a picture of it. Um, the side view here, you can see the, uh, the wall of the trench right here. And then another picture of the same thing. What the roots do is they, they try to get through the bottom of that trench and they break out and then they go, go to wherever they want to go. And so that, that was the biggest challenge. You may have different soils that you farm. They may be more forgiving than ours, but there may be other challenges, right? And so you know best what, what your challenges are. Um, what I was using at the time was this little poly wheel that uh, went on the, the, the closing wheels here and tried to push a little soil in the trench, right? Um, and that, that's basically all I knew about. We didn't have the internet then, so we could do a big search and find all this equipment and stuff. It's word of mouth, right? And so that's what we did. And uh, it didn't work too bad. That, that corn uh, in this picture here, it, it yielded fine. Probably could have been better with, without those conditions, but uh, we got through it. And um, then I went to uh, um, a furrow closing system that uh, ran at an angle. I tried to get a picture here, but uh, this is off a of video and it's dusty. And, but basically there are star wheels that uh, run at a high slope to the seed trench and they just cut the edge of that trench off. And uh, a former South Dakotan uh, developed that, he's in Kansas now. And that was the next thing I came across uh, that I thought could improve uh, my condition there. 
and uh, we since changed planters and uh, um, we couldn't get these anymore and so I, I, I changed again and uh, I've got those same star wheels that are in at an angle here, okay? But I, I put them uh, back on the planter as, as they would be put on there, but I put wedges in there so they're towed a little bit and I can throw, not throw, but gently push the soil a little bit in over that, that seed furrow and then my chain comes along and it, it just fills it in really nice. But the important thing, I think, and um, Matt Hange from Kansas and others, I believe, will support me in this is that seed firming is really important. You want that seed in the bottom of that seed furrow so they're all the same depth and you get really even emergence. And so uh, this is my system. Uh, the coulter's only there for, for planting soybeans in the corn stalks. That comes off for corn. I just move a little residue when I plant my corn and, and that's my planter um, that I use. But today you've got more tools. You've got the internet. You can get on there and if you type planter clothing reels in Google, you've got hundreds of options, don't you? And uh, so there's a lot more we can do and have available today. I'm not advocating any of them because I, I believe that you know um, what your problems might be on your farm and hopefully what, what might solve that. So in conclusion, um, I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them there. But uh, that prime stir, spur thing is only, it just means the first step. And so uh, think about that. And, and uh, cover crops are real important too. I've got a lot to learn on that. But I think if we get the tillage right, um, we're really doing a good thing. Yeah. You said on your farm, you just put a little starter down. What are you doing to get the bulk of your nitrogen out there then? Just, are you broadcasting that? That's all broadcast, yep. So you try to time it when there's some moisture coming to get it uh, rained in, or I mean, aren't you at risk of losing some to the atmosphere with that? Yeah, um, it's, it's broadcast urea. Um, it's put on uh, just before planting. Um, I like to put it on in April when we're get, catching some more rains. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of edgy with the fertile, with my person that runs the broadcaster. You know, gee, it's going to rain. I'd really like yeah, to get this on. Mm -hmm. I realize that's not totally possible in all situations. I have put a urease inhibitors in there if I feel I'm not going to catch a rain mm -hmm. uh, to kind of give me some more time. Okay. Yeah. Your planter setup's a little bit like ours. You talk about soil strength and no tail. Mm -hmm. uh, are you compacting ground and down with your tractor tires? With that tractor tires? Um, well, I, I, I believe that I've got uh, um, the soil is, is, can bear more load. And so it, it, I, I, I don't believe. I may have, I have some compaction probably. There's compaction in every field and even in conventional till fields because it's right at the bottom of where you run that disc or whatever you're running. Um, so, you, you know, I haven't, I did some bulk density measurements uh, a few years back and I was convinced that, uh, yeah, bulk density is higher than in conventional till field. That, that, that's, we know that. But I, I felt I wasn't going, uh, it wasn't getting worse.